everybody welcome back to the pacific war channel where we cover the entire pacific war from 1937 all the way up to 1945 and i'm joined here today by my guest it's dave holland from walking the battlefield the guadalcanal how are you yeah i'm doing good craig um thanks again for um, having me on so it's a pleasure and honor and i'm doing well today in um, freezing australia which a lot of people don't realize and we were discussing beforehand in canberra yeah. seasons are reverse so it's freezing in August. <laughs> Topsy turvy. Canadian over here is in the biggest heat wave we've seen in a long time. And you're freezing over there in Australia. Crazy yeah. world. And uh, I think this is pretty much one of the most interesting episodes that will be done in the Pacific War. I don't think I've seen anybody on YouTube cover the, all the Medal of Honors, especially for uh, Coral Canal. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was, um, I've been doing a lot of research involving the Medal of Honors on Guadalcanal. For a long time and um, i'm just waiting to put some product out it took me as you know i think we previously discussed i lived in guadalcanal uh, for two years straight and then uh, total for three years on um, small trips then and there and one of my goals was to locate every land uh, medal of honor site it's a bit difficult locating the sea and air ones uh, there was a number of medal of honors uh, earned on guadalcanal the officially there's 22 yeah. um but and during my course of travels and, and walking and uh, a lot of research, uh, lots of research, um, I've located every one of the Land Medal of Honor sites. So I thought I would love to, to share this uh, experience and um, information that I've, I gathered. And we got two big ones at the very beginning, Edson and Bailey, one of the most notorious battles. Yeah, so the, the first two we can cover, I'll, I'll, I'll combine those two guys. So it's... um. Uh, Red Mike Edson, uh, his nickname is Red Mike. So Mike Edson and um, <clears throat> Ken Bailey. So they were the, at the time, Edson was the commander of the 1st Raider Battalion. And he also had the 1st Parachute Battalion attached to them. Um, so he earned his Medal of Honor along with Bailey at the Battle of uh, Edson's Ridge or Bloody Ridge, as it's known. Um, basically, the fault between the um, dates of the 12th and the uh, 14th and 15th depends on who you speak to, of September 1942. Um, <clears throat> I've covered it on, on my show and a number of other uh, shows, the Battle of Bloody Ridge, so I won't go into the history of Bloody Ridge. But So Edson um, was basically a, um, a very aggressive leader. He, um, he always led by example, like a lot of these Marine officers did. First night, he, he um, I'll, I'll put it back, Bailey Bailey actually set up his battalion on Bloody Ridge, right? Because he knew the Japanese were probably going to attack from that direction. So Kawaguchi was a Japanese commander with the 35th Brigade. They were come up from the south um, along Bloody Ridge. And if you look at a map of Bloody Ridge, it's basically uh, a linear uh, feature straight to the airfield. It's only about the edge of the Bloody Ridge, the northern end of Bloody Ridge. is only about a thousand yards away from Henderson Airfield. Um, Thick jungle surrounds it, or at the time it surrounded it. And the Japanese called the ridge the centipede because from an aerial photograph, it looks like a centipede. And with the feet, with the um, legs, is the spurs of the ridges going off. They call it the, the centipede. So Japanese aerial reconnaissance had picked up. Um, if they wanted to attack, especially if you're going to bring a Japanese units, uh, especially that large, three battalions, through the thick jungle, at night, which the Japanese, uh, as you know, love to attack at night for the infiltration uh, techniques, that if they could hit that clear lineal um, terrain feature, they could just move very quickly and flood the airfield and overrun the airfield before the Marines could um, really have a chance to, to fight back. And at the time, Vandegrift only had a horseshoe shaped uh, perimeter defense. He didn't have enough troops to man that southern line other than. Uh, combat patrols and outposts. So Edson had recognized that along with the chief of staff, General Thomas of the 1st Marine Division, that it, it would be a, um, a key avenue of approach. Vandergriff at the time had moved his headquarters, the 1st Marine Division headquarters, up on the ridge itself to avoid what the Marines referred to as the V ring, which is the airfield when every day they would get hit daily by Japanese bombers. Yeah. And the V ring, um, 
during that era was the the middle target of a marine um rifle target it's a v-ring so they considered themselves in the middle of the v-ring it's not probably the best place to put a a, a division headquarters so it disrupted it so he said let's move up on the ridge to avoid the v-ring but he basically put his division command post basically on the front line um so Vandegrift said, no, they're not going to attack. They knew the Japanese were there coming. They're going to attack on the, the west flank to replicate that 21 August uh, Battle of Alligator Creek. But Edson and from his reconnaissance and in part with the um, Solomon Island scouts and some other reconnaissance and intelligence information they were receiving, they knew the Japanese were in the jungle, thousands of them. And he said, if I was a Japanese commander, I would attack there. So what Edson did, he, um, he between himself and the chief of staff, Thomas, they convinced Vandegrift, look, put us up on the ridge and we can rest. Knowing, and all we can serve is also your division uh, bodyguard. We've been hit pretty hard for the past few weeks, so we need some rest. And that's why they sold it to the division commander. So with his pre-thought and his um, good grasp of tactical situation, um, Edson was able to place his unit of roughly 800 Marines up on that ridge. And they, they placed them at the right time because uh, the next day, the Japanese started hitting that ridge with um, naval gunfire and bombing. And they knew that the Japanese, is another indication they were coming on Bloody Ridge. So what Edson did, he um, you'll see on the maps that I provided you, he, he um, set his forces up in three lines. Right over, he had about mm, 1,500 yards long, which is the ridge is, and thick jungle on both sides. And he set his um, units up in three lines uh, between the uh, the Raiders and the Para uh, Marines Battalion. When I said Para Marine Battalions, at that stage, they're only about 250, 300 effective. So they wasn't really a full strength battalion. And the Raiders had roughly about 500 guys. So they have, he had about 800 and I think 50 um, on strength. So he set up in three lines and he knew the Japanese were going to attack. So he had his... um patrols out and they came across some Japanese and they said look they're coming so the first night the, the Japanese attacked uh, once again I'm not going to go into the Battle of Bloody Ridge but unfortunately for the Japanese commander Kawaguchi um, he would, wasn't able to coordinate his attacks due to a number of factors obviously the thick jungle and the terrain and um, the guys who had to cover a large area yeah um, so and the Barrett Battalion never even made it to the spot so, oh yeah not the first day, yeah, because he had it was actually a good plan, you know. They, they had, yeah. um, they had three, um, he had two diversionary attacks supposed to be on the flanks. He had one on, on the east flank from the remnants of the Cheeky, the guys that was uh, a Cheeky detachment, the guys, um, the, the Bear Battalion, the Kuma Battalion, the guys who uh, supposed to have been the second echelon that the Cheeky should have waited for. Mm -hmm. But he had those guys attacking the east flank. He had Oka, um, and another battalion of the 124th attacking on the west flank um i actually good have a good video on that it's called the um l company ridge i just made it and a lot of people don't even know anything about the guadalcanal campaign or know quite a bit about the guadalcanal campaign that that fight gets left out and so also the battle of the overland uh trail which i did another one on that one that was the other two flanking attacks that generally get left out in the overall uh, telling of the the battle of bloody ridge but um so there's some good videos or some good um, information to look up for those two side attacks because they're very important too, especially the Battle of Overland Trail. Um, so Edson, the first night when the, when the Japanese attacked, they only could attack with one battalion on Edson's right flank. And that, that attack on the right flank pushed one of Edson's companies back. So in the morning, this was the morning of the 12th and 13th. So the morning of the 13th, or sorry, the 13th, of, yeah, 12th and 13th. So in the morning of the 13th of September, um, Edson was faced with um, his right flank had been pulled back, a refuse, so to speak, in the old 1800s speak. So his right flank was pushed back. And he knew the Japanese, he knew from intelligence the Japanese were, you know, a few thousand. And he knew they only attacked with a few hundred that night. Edson figured it was a probing attack. Uh, he wasn't aware that obviously that you know, Kawaguchi didn't do a probing attack, that he tried to attack full speed, but he only had... An, a portion of his forces to do it but Edson knew that next second night they would probably come with with everything they had he said if they come with everything they had they will they know we're up on the ridge now and they'll try to flank us again and go around us he said and, and then they'll probably throw 
thousands of Japanese through there and they'll cut us off. So we had two far deployed companies and he said, well, if they cut us off, I would, you know, they'll cut us in two. So once again, Edson can read, uh, could read, uh, read the ground quite well. He was very known for that. Um, so what Edson did, he pulled his front line back about 400 yards and what that did. And he put him to the second line. So he had three lines the first day and then he consolidated them into two lines. And on that second line, then it opened up a, a killing space of about 150 to 200 yards. And you have to remember, too, um, pre-battle, the division uh, art, uh, artillery commander, Pedro de Val, had came up partially, him and his officers, and pre-registered um, 75 millimeter and 105 millimeter howitzers. Because the Marines at that stage had four battalions of artillery, the 11th Marines, which is the artillery regiment. And they'd actually brought one um, battalion of the 75s almost directly up to the ridge itself. Well, on the bottom of the ridge, you had 105s at the airfield. So they had pre-registered that whole area. And the Japanese, one Japanese officer said they were getting hit with so much artillery, he thought the Americans had machine gun artillery, as he, he called it, machine gun artillery. I think they fired, um, the second night, they fired over 2,000 rounds, 105s alone. And the barrels were almost burning out. They were just pumping through ammo. But anyway, they pre-registered it. So he pre-registered, he set his machine guns up. Um, and as you we probably discussed before, the, the Marines um, only could dig um, small shell scrapes, so to speak. They didn't have anybody, had like one or two strands of barbed wire, um, and they only had two days to dig in. So it wasn't like they had fixed defensive position. So on the second night, the Japanese attacked, and they attacked with the two battalions, and they had another battalion. It would never, ever got into the fight, only elements of it. You know, they were actually lost in the jungle, which is – was Kawaguchi's main uh, battalion, one of those what ifs. But they attacked, um, they pushed the Marines back um, throughout the night, and they basically consolidated around Edson's command post, which is <clears throat> um, hill number two, or, um, or hill 120, if you want to put it in feet. But the Marines could refer to it as hill number two. Edson's command post had formed the horseshoe uh, defense around it. So uh, throughout the night, Edson basically was 10 yards behind the front line, behind the machine gun post. At times, he was standing up on an um, ammunition box, yelling at his men, um, directing fire himself. At one stage, he was directing artillery fire himself. Um, he had bullets nicking his uniforms. He had uh, runners and radio men shot left and right uh, around him. Um, he never wavered. Uh, at one stage, the Marines were getting hit with um, Japanese phosphorus not phosphorus, but um, it's like the, the cordite and magnesium and some of the flares the Japanese are firing had a peculiar smell to it. And I think some of the Japanese were firing and they seen the smoke, they had that smell. Neither was either the Japanese or some of the Marines started yelling, gas, gas, gas. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and some of the Marines on the left side, left flank, started to retrograde, so to speak, started to bug out, as they called it, started to move out, started to panic a bit. So Edson basically was yelling at them and saying, look, there's one thing the Japanese have that you don't, his guts. He says, get in your holes. He says, if you need to die in your holes, you're going to die in your holes. Or we're not leaving this. You know, we have to protect this airfield. And he was <clears throat> basically at one stage had his 45 out. I don't know if he's going to shoot anyone, but he, he, he was yelling at, at people to, and hold them back. And then not so much the Marines that out of fear they stayed. I think he shamed them. And that was a big factor because these are the Raiders, supposed to be the best uh, troops the Marines have. And I think um, some of the other officers are saying, oh, you call yourself Marines? You're not Marines. Get in there. You're Marines. You've got to, you know, you have to live up to your reputation. So that held held them together in that, that, that tight moment. And, and as you know, the Battle of Edson's Ridge or Bloody Ridge, it was hand-to-hand -hand fighting. It was very intense. Um, and it was a, a near-run thing, so to speak. You know, the author Richard Frank said it was probably the, the closest the Marines ever come to losing the campaign. You know, of course, it would have been a big what if the Japanese would have made it to the airfield in, in, in vast numbers. You know, it would have been hard for Marines to try to get out or get out of that. But anyway, um, <clears throat> he held. And because of his uh, inspiration, his courage, and his leadership, he was a big part of, of holding those Marines together to, to hold in, in place to stop the Japanese. 
Um, so that was why Edson, he earned his Medal of Honor for that specific uh, act he did, that display of, of high courage. Um, and he was later, right after that battle, uh, nominated to um, uh, take over the command of the 5th Marine Regiment. And, and then he later on, later went on to do bigger and better things throughout the war. Uh, I actually was wondering, um, because the way that this will probably come out, uh, this will be a one piece for, for my podcast immediately, but I'm going to try and do, like you said, everything that you've given me, make the visuals and cut it up in the episodes. But if you could just tell uh, my audience, you know, just a bit about your channel and why they should check you out. Oh, yeah, I have um, I have a YouTube channel called uh, Guadalcanal Walk in the Battlefield. Initially, I started up uh, where I, I basically walked these sites and had my two-year deployment there. I wanted to research and, and drill down on all the stuff I read about Guadalcanal. You know, one, I wanted to check the facts, and plus I wanted to get on um, areas which is kind of off the grid that most people don't go to, especially if you do the, the, the tours there, the week-long tours. They'll go to the main points. And I've made it for them. And also, mainly, I made it for the people who would never get a chance to go to Guadalcanal um, so they can experience something. And also to capture what Guadalcanal looks like in well, when I was filming from 2018 to 2020. Um, due to COVID and a few other things, uh, I no longer am due to work. I'm, I'm not at Guadalcanal. I'm hoping to go back maybe later this year and definitely next year and, and do some more on-the-ground filming. Now, in the meantime, I've... I've started interviewing other people about Guadalcanal. I mean, next week I'm doing a, um, for the anniversary, the Battle of Sabo Island, which is a naval aspect, because I cover mainly the land. And the three-dimensional Guadalcanal campaign is, is unreal with the air, land, and sea. Yeah. Um, I've got a, a guest, uh, Jeff Ballard, he's appearing to talk about the, the naval aspects and, and on the anniversary of the Battle of Sabo Island, which is the worst defeat in U.S. naval history. Um, yeah, it was so We'll nice be discussing there. that. Oh, yeah. And then I also do, you know, a number of other videos. I've done, you know, the Getty Patrol. I've done uh, Chesty Puller being wounded. Um, I've just got, I got one upcoming, the U.S. Army role on Guadalcanal. I've got the 164. So I'm focusing, <coughs> excuse me, I'm focusing on, until I can get back on the ground filming, I'm focusing. So, but my videos I cover, it's like I'm giving you a tour when I'm walking there. Mm-hmm. It's like meeting you, I'm giving you a one-on-one tour. Um, my videos don't have a lot of uh, whistles and bells, so to speak, to it. You know, I call it pure history. Someone, one of my viewers said, "This is pure history with no frills." I'm like, "Yeah, okay." Because when I filmed it, I filmed it on an iPhone Seven. Yeah. You know, yeah. I edited it on an iPhone Seven, and I uploaded it on Solomon Island Internet. So it was just, it's, 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 you know, it's a miracle even it got put up. Hey, it's also, a, oh yeah. I have an uh, adjoining Facebook site. It's called same thing, walking uh, Guadalcanal, walking a battlefield on Facebook, and I update that every two or three days. And I try to include things in there that's never been seen before you in relation have. to Guadalcanal. You yes, yeah, so fresh material. You you've found new material about Guadalcanal. In all honesty, if people were to ask who are some of the experts on the actions of Guadalcanal, I think you could be argued to be one of them now. Um, no, yeah, I'm one of the supreme geeks, I guess you could say. There's a, there's a club of nerds, Guadalcanal nerds. There's a few of us. So. Yeah, we, we bounce stuff amongst ourselves. Peter Flavin's in Australia, too. He's like one of the best then and now photoed guys. I don't know how many trips he's made. Yeah. It's but yeah, that's the, my two channels. Yeah. And hopefully, I'll, I'll get some fresh um, tour tour stuff there it's been a real yeah. honor to talk to you again i stress my audience please go check out his stuff you will not find anything like your channel your channel is extremely original it's one of the most interesting channels when it comes to this kind of history on the pacific war i can't think of anybody else who's doing anything like you and uh what can i say i hope everyone checks you out